This is Takufu Zuberi, and you're listening to Genealogy Gems Podcast. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 63. And yes, indeed, that was Tafuku Zuberi from the television show The History Detectives starting off this episode. You know, it's funny how things kind of come in threes. You've heard that before, haven't you? Well, that's kind of what's been happening around here. First, I got in touch with Darby Hinton, who I had heard was working on a new history series. And then the show Legend Seekers was getting ready to hit the airwaves. So I chatted with Ken Marks, the executive producer, to kind of find out what was going on behind the scenes there. And the next thing you know, I have an opportunity to interview Tofuku Zuberi in anticipation of his upcoming keynote address at the Genealogical Jamboree in Southern California this June. So we've just been sort of riding the genealogy television wave lately around here, haven't we? (laughs) Well, it's funny because it all sort of got started because NBC had announced back in January that the new show, Who Do You Think You Are?, which is the uh, genealogy-related show coming over from Great Britain to America, that that show was going to be launching in April of this year, in 2009. Then a month or so later, um, my sources had told me that, indeed, its launch had been postponed. There was a lot of jockeying for time slots going on, and NBC was kind of rethinking its reality shows um, that it has slated, which is probably a good idea. Uh, I reported on it in the Genealogy Gems news blog on February 5th, 2009, which I remember because it was my birthday, and I was so bummed out to hear the news that the show was not going to be starting in April. And then Diane Haddad and I uh, talked about it on the February 2009 Family Tree Magazine podcast, the fact that it had been postponed. But then in March, someone out there in the genealogical blogosphere must have spotted the old press release from January that said that it was going to be launching April 20th. And the next thing you know, everyone in the blogosphere was reporting that information. (laughs) It was really interesting to watch. In fact, in the last episode, I kind of felt like I I needed to mention it because it was being so widely reported and it kind of looked to me like maybe I just missed a press release or something. Uh, I certainly didn't want to have you guys miss the premiere of the show because I hadn't somehow heard about it. You know, there can be a lot of pressure (laughs) to post a lot when you're a blogger, uh, no matter what your topic is, and sometimes Folks just take what somebody else reports, assumes it's good information, and just passes it along on their blog. Gosh, kind of sounds a little bit like genealogy can be, doesn't it? I mean, you see something in a memoir or post it on an online family tree, and the next thing you know, it's spreading like wildfire, and no one's really stopping to ask for sources or go find the source themselves before passing it on. That's actually a subject that we go into in depth in the recent episode of the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, uh, episode number 23. The genealogical proof standard is a tool that pros use, and I really want to encourage all researchers, professional or not, to follow it as well, because it causes you to stop and think before passing on information. And in episode 23, I'm providing you with a free downloadable research worksheet that incorporates the elements of the GPS, while prompting you to find, and even more importantly, document those sources. So I really encourage you to check that out, uh, check out that episode if you haven't already, and not only download the free research worksheet, but also I have there for you um, on the webpage for that episode, a completed example case study worksheet that you can also take a look at to kind of see it in action. So anyway, I thought it was a really interesting phenomenon to watch how information spreads. And as it turns out, my source was correct. (laughs) And the blogs that followed were running with something that was based on, I think, old information. I think it was that old press release back from January. So there is no premiere date as of this recording. That's kind of the bottom line. But I'm going to stick with my solid sources, and I will let you know as soon as I get word as to when Who Do You Think You Are is going to be coming out on American television. 
So as I said, we're still riding that genealogy television wave with or without who do you think you are. And on today's show, we are going to get to spend some time with Dr. Tofuku Zuberi, who's heading into his seventh season with the television show, The History Detectives on PBS. He's going to share his experiences working on the show, uh, talk about what gives your research real meaning, and give you a sneak peek at what he'll be talking about at the Jamboree. So, you know, showing how that everyday lived life experience of people who go through their various struggles to make their reality what it is, that's what comes together to make the world what it is. That's what comes together to make history what it is. And it's the social context of it that gives it meaning. But I want to talk about what's really going on behind uh, the scenes in terms of these things, not only on the history detectives, but as people attempt to uh, gain a better insight of their own uh, genealogy. Who are they? How do they find uh, this long-lost relative? And then what happens when they do find them? And what is the significance of this for us all? Tofuku is a fascinating guy, and I know that you're really going to enjoy this interview. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about recent additions to online records. Well, in March, Ancestry reported that they are adding or updating more than 775 databases and or book titles on Ancestry.com. And that's an average of more than 35 titles each workday, quite a bit. Um, As for new content, last week they announced the first release of a collection that is all about the history of London and all its inhabitants over a 400-year period. And the records include parish and workhouse records, electoral rolls, wills, land tax records, and school records. Uh, When complete, the collection is supposed to include more than 77 million records. And updated collections include the UK city and county directories from 1600 to 1900s, Vancouver, British Columbia passenger list. Those are Chinese arrivals um, just for six years, 1906 to 1912. The Sands directories, Sydney and New South Wales, Australia, 1858 to 1933. And uh, some of the collections that are going to be coming soon to Ancestry are the U.S. Family and Local History Books, That is expected to begin here in April of 2009, and they've recently been focusing on Canadian and international family and local history books, but in April, they're beginning to release more U.S. family and local history books, and they say that they usually release at least one new book every weekday. Might want to be checking back to see what's new there. Also coming up are going to be Delaware 1890 U.S. Census Fragment. South Dakota Territorial and State Censuses, 1885 and 1895. That's an update. Returns from U.S. military posts between 1800 and 1916. Now, that's expected to launch in May. And those returns are mostly from military posts around the U.S. containing the names of individuals at each post, uh, the names and the duties of the officers, the number of officers, and lots of other great information. Um, the images are going to be released by themselves first and then put into the World Archives Project for community members to help transcribe. They're also expecting an update on the World War II draft registration cards in May of 2009. And they'll be adding draft cards for the state of Illinois. Uh, this is more of the fourth generation or old man's draft, as they called it. And there's going to be the U.S. Historical Newspapers Collection. That will be getting updated in May. Papers from new cities are going to be added. And also in May, you take a look for the Alabama State Census, 1820, 1850, 1855, and 1866. And that is also part of the World Archives Project. Also, an update in May on the 1890 U.S. federal censuses. These are going to be improved images, newer, higher quality images that are replacing the current images that are out there. And finally, um, Ancestry has been talking about launching some upcoming improvements to the website. Now, one of them is lifespan filtering. 
They've heard loud and clear from all of you who've um, gotten in touch with them about this and have told them that you don't want to see the 1930 census results when searching for someone who died in 1890. So they are going to be making a search algorithm change this month that will stop results from showing up that are outside a person's stated lifespan. So hopefully that will help you hone in a little quicker on the people that you're looking for. And they'll be announcing more information about that as they get a little closer to the launch. The other um, thing that they are looking at adding to the website is Hint Engine for Trees. The Ancestry R&D team has been working on a newer, faster Hint Engine to replace their existing one that you find on Ancestry.com member trees. So this April, April 2009, they will replace the part of their system that provides hints to other trees, not the hints for records, just other trees. And the main benefits of this new hinting engine are supposed to be faster calculations of new hints and the ability to consider a larger set of other trees as they develop the tree hints. So later this year, they expect to replace the record hinting with similar benefits also for their users. So lots of great things to look forward to. And uh, next, we will look forward to hearing from some of you in the mailbox. Well, I got an email this week from Megan Kaiser out of Ohio. And uh, let me read it to you. And I want to get some of your input on this. She says, hi, I love your podcast. I have a question. I have Family Tree Maker 2009 Platinum Edition. I have at least one instance in my husband's tree where two first cousins married. This, of course, means that some of the tree overlaps itself. I cannot get the Family Tree Maker software to recognize that the people are the same. I tried contacting the software company and got nowhere. I read all the booklet that came with the program, and I read all through the help files in the program. Do you or any of your listeners know if I am just missing something or can it not be done? This is beyond frustrating as I'm trying to get all the research into the computer and organized, but I can't finish that family until I know what to do. Thanks in advance for any help that you can offer. I love your podcast and subscribe to Family Tree Magazine, Genealogy Gems, and Family History Genealogy Made Easy. Keep up the great work and thanks. Well, thank you, Megan, for writing in. And I am just going to say right up front, I don't use Family Tree Maker software, so I am clueless about what the answer to this question is. But I know that there are thousands of you out there who do listen, and I'm sure that many of you may be using Family Tree Maker and could help Megan out. So I'm putting a call to action out to all of you listening. If you have an answer from Megan Kaiser about how to deal with this first cousin issue within Family Tree Maker 2009 Platinum Edition, drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to uh, record a voicemail with your answer, and I'll play it on the show, would love to do it, call 925-272-4021. And let's see if we can't help Megan out uh, to solve this problem so that she can keep going forward. By now, you have probably heard that the Southern California Genealogical Society is holding their annual jamboree on June 26th through the 28th. But what you may not know is that there is a lot more to the jamboree than just great classes and the exhibitors. For example, at the Friday night banquet, they have arranged for a very special keynote speaker, and I'm really excited to have him here on the show with me today. Now, you know him as one of the sleuths from the PBS series History Detectives, Takufu Zuberi. Welcome to the show, Takufu. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, I am so glad that you could join me today. I know you've got a busy schedule, but we are all looking forward to hearing from you at the Jamboree. But now, before we get into what's going to be going on at the Jamboree and your visit there, let's talk a little bit about what all the genealogists know you from and are and have enjoyed so much, and that is your History Detectives television show. Is it now in its sixth season? Uh, Lisa, this is going on our seventh season. Going on your seventh. Last year was our sixth season, and this year will be our seventh season. And we've been filming. I've been out in the field 
traveling all over America, going where others not dare go <laughs> to find the truth of some very, very important object. Uh, sometimes a not so important object. <laughs> right. That's part of what you're discovering there, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So it's been a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful season. I, you know, there's two components to these seasons for me. There's the one where we film the episodes and then the ones where they show the episodes and the filming of it is really a joy because basically people in America, everyday people in America, have opened their doors and allowed us to come in with our camera crew and everything and they have made it a, a very hospitable situation for us. They've been very inviting and they open the doors to their lives as well, uh, you know. And so we've had some fantastic episodes coming up for the Institute of Detectives this year. Well, and, and that makes so much sense because you guys are really blending everyday people's stories with American history, with world history, and it's wonderful that they invite you in and that you get a chance to share how those things connect. Right, and that's what it is. It's making those connections. And, you know, often we forget that history is a result of everyday people living their lives. We tend to think of the historical figures, the very famous people uh, and events, as uh, the real markers of history. On the history detectives, we take a different slant. We take all of those great events, all of those great individuals, and we break them down to a very personal story based on an object or a story uh, that relates to somebody's life. And in that way, we try to bring history alive and show how it is always reflected in the living, in what we do and how we remember the past. Exactly. And I think you're really giving everyone who watches a sense that they, too, have these unique stories and, and these unique objects they may have overlooked, but you give them a new perspective on, maybe I ought to go back and take a second look at that and, and investigate it a little further. Right. Get back up in there in that attic, in that basement, in that garage, dig deep in that closet, look at that suitcase that nobody wants to open, blow the dust off of it, and you might have a history detective story right in front of you. There you go. And I noticed that on, on the website, they even, you guys even solicit folks to propose their stories to you. And that brings me to my first question, which was, how do you go about selecting the stories? You must have a lot to choose from. And those are some of the best stories we find, is when someone has dug deep down. I just filmed a story in which a woman was looking in a suitcase, which her great-grandmother had left her. And in this suitcase, she found some letters in which one of her distant relatives supposedly wrote to the American Colonization Society and supposedly wrote to his other relatives attempting to convince them all that they should move to Liberia. Oh, wow. And he wanted to know if this was true, if he ever moved, and all this other information. But she dug it out of a trunk that she inherited, you know, from, uh, from her relative, blowed off the dust, and said, here's my story. And it was a wonderful story, led oh. to a very fascinating investigation. She didn't get the answer she wanted, but she got a bigger surprise in the end. I imagine that happens quite often. I'm, I'm guessing when you go into investigating a story, you don't always know what the end result is uh, before, you, oh. perhaps by the time you get filming. But um, when you first get into it, you just kind of have to follow the trail, right? You have to follow the trail, and you have to see where it's going. And, you know, sometimes you have a forgery. Sometimes you have uh, a misinterpretation of what something means. Often people have an object, and then they assume that the person who was in possession of the object engaged in certain activities, and they want to know, was that so? And so we're in the situation where we have to do the history of the object the provenance of the object, but then situated in the larger historical context to look at what significance it had in moving us this way or that way. So, you know, when we first get the object, 
we have no idea where the story is going to go. And this is some of the most exciting thing about working on the history detectives is this point of discovery. The excitement is in the process of investigating it and finding out something new. You know, so it, you know, and it, sometimes it's an object that you find out new. Sometimes it's surprising, very surprising what you turn up in doing a genealogy for someone. You know, because often on our show, we find relatives that people had not been connected to, and we reunite them right there on the program. Oh, wow, that must be amazing. A, a perk they didn't even know was coming, right? That's right. It typically is. And, you know, people never uh, never tire of being shocked at that because, you know, we tend to think we could reach out and touch all of our relatives, but sometimes it's not that easy. So, you know, it's actually uh, a, a very exciting process to go through uh, this whole thing where you're looking up someone's genealogy and then to to discover that, in fact, their genealogy has some surprises in it, some surprises that they may not have anticipated. And we have at least a few of those stories, a few more of those types of stories this season. And that's a really good reminder, particularly, I would think, in this day and age, it's getting easier and easier to forge a document when we hear those stories. And you guys, as you approach them, you always remind the viewers you know, you can't just take the initial information as gospel. You know, you have to start by questioning that and then move forward down the trail. That's right. So looking back at the all these seasons that you've done, do you have a particular episode that uh, sticks out in your mind or that was just a shocker for you that you, you still look back fondly on? Uh, you know, I have a couple. One show which uh, really, uh, I don't know, kind of, helped me see the potential of what could be done on the history detectives. Because, you know, for me, the, the history detectives was the first opportunity I had of doing television like this. I was a scholar working at my research all these years. Exactly. And so what the history detectives did is it allowed me to become involved in television in a way that I hadn't been involved in before. And that's fascinating for me, and it has been uh, fascinating uh, for me because it has allowed me to to really get involved in um, you know in 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 people's lives and in understanding about people's lives in ways that I had never done before. So you know, I've had those stories that I was involved in that really. Uh, you know, really showed me a different side of America, a different side of what was going on. And so all of the stories have been, you know, been fabulous to work on. And I've, I've really appreciated, um, you know, the journey that it has allowed me to go on. But in season one, uh, I re- you know, one story that I recall, it was mm-hmm. like in episode nine, it was a ventriloquist dummy. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you remember, I mean, you can imagine that back at the turn of the century, you know, the 20th century, between the 1900s and, and uh, between the 1800s and 1900s, mm-hmm. uh, that the main kind of entertainment, if you went to the theater, was vaudeville. Right. You know, it was it was kind of announced as a show with something for everyone because they did so much there. Uh, you know, but it was a world, especially in New York, that was dominated by white entertainers. Mm-hmm. And the story we worked on was about Sam. Now, Sam was a was the first black ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> wow! To appear on Broadway, being operated by an African American. Now, you know, at first sight, that's like, wow, what's going on? Well, it led me to do the genealogy of this dummy. Of the dummy? not <laughs> Of the dummy. Wow. Where did the dummy come from? Was the dummy related to, you know, the the famous dummy? Right. Um, Charlie McCarthy? And, and Yeah, that's right. That's right. What, was he? <laughs> who Who is this dummy? <laughs> you know, so here I, you know, we go out to... Um, you know, um, go across these River to Crown Heights in Brooklyn, and we and I interview the daughter 
of uh, of John W. Cooper. You know, this wonderful woman. Joan was a wonderful woman. She, her name was Joan Maynard. She just died recently. Mm. but And she had Sam in a box on a shelf in her kitchen. Wow. And, you know, and basically, you know, she, she wanted to know. She wanted to know, um, you know, was Sam made by the same person? Who made the you know the legendary star of American radio and television, Charlie McCarthy? Right. And so that led me to have to do the genealogy of a dummy. Now you know, I mean, who <laughs> made Sam? And was Sam made by the same person that made Charlie McCarthy? And so you know, in some ways, Charlie McCarthy, the dummy, was related to Sam. Real? It turned out that that was true. Is that right? <laughs> yes, it turned out that it was. He was made by the same. So she had stuck on her shelf this this doll. And I think you know, if you went to go buy Charlie McCarthy, it would probably cost you several million dollars. Yeah. And this is a just as famous a, a dummy, and she had it sitting on her shelf, blew the dust off of it, and it turns out to be this famous dummy. Not only that, we were able to explain to her how her father integrated uh, vaudeville. And then on top of that, we located a tape recording, a record, a phonograph, a record, which was, a, you know, an album, as they used to call them, which had the voice of her father and, you know, him performing his act with Sam. Had she heard that before? We played it for her in tears. She oh. explained, I had not heard, she had not heard her father's voice since the 1960s when he died. Wow. How, where in the so, world did you find the record? It was, it, we were doing research and doing our background research. We found this information oh. out about, um, you know, ab- about John W. Cooper, who was her father. And, you know, and he was a pretty well known African American ventriloquist, uh, you know, from the turn of the century all the way up to the 50s. And so, you know, there was a recording made of him doing his act. Someone who was recording famous ventriloquist acts. Oh, how specific and unique. And really, you were not only restoring the family history to her, but you were really restoring American entertainment history. That's right. That's absolutely right. And, you know, and it's always amazing that in, in doing some of these stories, we're able to do that because we're able to go places where others didn't go or people have sat it down. I mean, you know, last season we did this story around a particular book, which was, you know, and the question is, is this novel? And if it's a novel, who wrote it? And did this certain person write it? And we were able to establish who did not write it. And that was who most people had claimed that wrote it. We oh. did research this story had not done in terms of, of that whole research. And when we talked to them, they were quite uh, fascinated to, to have received the information. I mean, you know, this season we did another story, which was about, it's about an, a Native American who uh, supposedly received a pardon from President Fillmore. You know, and the question is, why did President Fillmore pardon this particular Native American? Right. And now this is a major thing. Given that presidential pardons were very rare, right. the turn of you know in the middle of the nineteenth century, and so in when we talked to the various historians of that area, either historians of presidential pardons or historians of Native American history, they knew nothing about this case. Wow! And did we were you able to bring that to light? You tracked it down. That's right. And then to not only bring to light the historical fact, but the social context of it. Yes, to exactly. give people a sense of why it's happening and why it's important and, you know, and, and what it meant for it to happen at that time. And just because it hasn't made its way into the history books doesn't make it something that is not fundamentally important historically. So, you know, showing how that everyday lived life experience of people who go through their various struggles to make their reality what it is, that's what comes together to make the world what it is. That's what exactly. comes together to make history what it is. And it's the social context of it that gives it meaning. Stay tuned because I've got more for you from Tofuku Zuberi right after this. Are you looking for a way to get even more genealogy gems that will power boost your research, inspire your creativity, and give you the motivation that you need to tackle that brick wall? Well, become a Genealogy Gems Premium member. 
You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month, packed with great information that you can use right away, an instructional video series walking you through the best Internet tools step-by-step. Our current series is called Google, a goldmine of genealogy gems. And in each episode, you can follow along with me as I show you online how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a premium member. But don't just take my word for it. Here's what your fellow podcast listeners have to say. This is Melissa Parker in Tennessee. I'm just calling to let you know how much I'm enjoying your Genealogy Podcast Premium Edition. I especially love the handwriting analysis with Paul Lasassi. And all the tips and information that you give is just so wonderful. I would encourage anyone to become a member of your Genealogy Gems Podcast Premium. To become a premium member and start reaping the benefits right away, go to genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's S-A-V-E-2-0, you will get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Well, let's head back to my conversation with Tefuku and hear from him what he will be talking about at the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree in June of 2009. Now, I know that you are a, a doctor. You are a Dr. Zuberi at the University of Pennsylvania. And I know yes. not everybody knows about your extensive research work that you've done in the university setting. As you mentioned, this is your first time doing television. How has the experience changed your academic work? I mean, you have gone from the academic setting to -to face-to-face and hands-on, and I'm sure there was a lot of hands-on before, but you're really talking with the folks and impacting their lives and then bringing it to the masses. How has that changed your view on history and the work that you do? I am a, I, I, I think of myself as a teacher, and so I would love to be able to teach in a variety of contexts to make and have as much of an impact as I can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I'm teaching to five students or speaking to the millions on the history detectives, in both cases, I feel that I am responsible for everything I say. And I am responsible for taking advantage of this great opportunity to give information that will be useful to people as they attempt to make it a better world. And what I mean by that is that my research in uh, in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania has allowed me to go all over the world because my research has involved and engaged the entire world, and especially Africa. So I've probably visited every country in Africa, most of the countries in Europe, a lot of the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And and in these visits, I have had the opportunity to also engage in education, in teaching, and in trying to deliver uh, the message from what I've learned by observing my reality and to use that information to help us make it a better world. So I think that when I do the history detectives, I'm engaging in the same thing, only rather than talking to five people in a class or a 100 people in a class or uh, 500 people at some large academic meeting, I'm speaking to millions. So my responsibility is just that much more important, and that's how seriously I take it. Well, I think I think it's tremendous, and I think we're all very fortunate to have somebody with your background reaching us through our television sets. And I know that the genealogists who are going to be attending the Jamboree in June are really excited about getting to be recipients of the kind of teaching that you do. Tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing at the Jamboree. Well, I'm going to talk about finding your roots in the 21st century. And I'm going to talk about the lessons that I think we can offer from the history detectives. You know, it, it, the, 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 the big thing I think that I bring to the history detectives is, you know, my view, my observation of historical and cultural processes that really shape the world we're living in, 
really shape the society that we engage with. So my presentation is going to probably start with just uh, the, the, the basic notion, uh, you know, that knowing yourself is really important. You know, this goes all the way back to the Egyptians who, who had a saying uh, that the first lesson in life is to know yourself. Uh, and then I'll talk about my many, gener you know, many kind of genealogical investigations on the history detectives, uh, and what I've learned from them, and some of the, you know, the implications of that in terms of the recent boom in genealogical research. You know, you got all of these uh, internet-based programs, whether it's AfricanAncestry.com, Ancestry.com, FindYourRoots.com, mm -hmm. and you know, a whole host of other new technologies, which are allowing people to peer into their ancestry by pointing and clicking on the internet, and then going out and collecting a little bit of information. Uh, but I want to talk about what's really going on behind uh, the scenes in terms of these things, not only on the history detectives, but as people attempt to uh, gain a better insight of their own uh, genealogy. Who are they? How do they find uh, this long-lost relative? And then what happens when they do find them? And what is the significance of this for us all? Uh, you know, and I'll... You know, I'll talk about a little bit about these new technologies and how they work and, and give some tips on how to avoid some scams and, um, you know, become a genealogical detective yourself as you're engaging in these processes uh, and using these new uh, technologies. I'll kind of conclude, you know, with my own personal information, uh, you know, a little bit about my own genealogy and how my own investigation using some of these new technologies, where it took me. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. I, I think you're absolutely right. As records become more readily available, then we find we have a little bit of extra time and we become really yearning for that contextual information. How do these people fit into history and, and all of those elements? I, I just think we're all going to be um, riveted and really excited to hear you speak at the Jamboree. Excellent. I really look forward to it. Hey, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today on the podcast. All right. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this genealogy channel surfing episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. My thanks to Tofuku Zuberi from the History Detective Show for joining me today on this show. To stay up to date on everything that's going on with the podcast, be sure and sign up for my free e-newsletter. You'll get two emails a month with kind of some sneak peeks about what's coming up on the show and research tips and recommended websites that you're not going to find anywhere else. And best of all, what you will not find anywhere else is that in your confirmation email, you will get a link to my free ebook. It's five fabulous strategies for Google research for family historians. It's a 20 page ebook full of tips and ideas that you can just start using right away. Good, simple working tips that will help you be more effective in using Google. So just head to the website at genealogygems.tv. Click the little uh, sign up box on the left hand column and uh, you'll get the newsletter and you'll also get that free ebook on Google research tips. Well, have a wonderful week. I'll look forward to hearing from some of you on your tips and ideas for our podcast listener and their question about Family Tree Maker software. But until then, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.